Hey guys, this is John with NP Board Review coming to you with our second set of the first 25 sample questions with the ANCC. And we'll go ahead and start back where we left off. Uh, number six. So, number six, 15 year old patient with type 1 diabetes reports elevated glucose levels in the morning. The NP determines that the hyperglycemia is due to the dawn phenomenon and A, increases the insulin dosage at bedtime. B, reduces the dosage at bedtime. C, tests the blood glucose level at 3 a.m. every morning. And D, tests the blood glucose level in the morning. Now, here's where they try to trick you because you go, hmm, dawn phenomenon. I sort of remember that. There was the dawn phenomenon and something, something else. And what am I supposed to do? And, you know, they want to make sure you know the difference between the dawn phenomenon and this emoji effect. So let's review both of those real quick. So dawn phenomenon usually causes a steady rise in the blood glucose, you know, starting at bedtime and then starting to increase between 2 and 8 a.m. So you'll see it continue to rise throughout the night where the emoji effect, let's click on this one right here. So our blood glucose going to bed is okay. It drops and drops and drops, goes down to a critically low level, and then the body boosts up the sugar and then it trends downward again. And this typically happens at about 3 a.m. So that's the 3 a.m. thing that they're trying to trick you with. So let's, keeping that in mind, let's go through these questions again, or these answers again. Do we want to increase the dosage at bedtime? Do we want to reduce it? Do we, or do we want to test for it? Okay, so remember what I said in our earlier video. Two of these you can get rid of pretty much immediately. We know that the patient's glucose level is elevated already. So we know we don't really need to test because it already says we already have the dawn phenomenon. So this question is trying to test, do you know what dawn phenomenon is and do you know what to do with it? So we've already tested. We already know that this is dawn phenomenon. So we can get rid of both of these. We don't need a test anymore. So now our, our answers are either going to be A or B. Increase the insulin dosage or reduce the insulin dosage. And remember the difference between the dawn phenomenon and the Samoji, we either reduce or we increase. For the dawn phenomenon, we increase because remember, it starts at a regular level and it continues to climb upward, meaning that we need to give more coverage. Samoji is where it drops down too low. The body reacts, increases the glucose levels in the blood, and that's why we get the elevated level. So dawn, we want to increase the insulin dosage. If it was Samoji, we want to reduce the insulin dosage so we don't get that low level in the middle of the night. Okay, next one. Now we get to some good antibiotic questions, which is, and these are always interesting, always seem, tends to trip people up. So, number seven, an 78-year-old gentleman with heart failure develops a bacterial UTI secondary to an indwelling Foley catheter. The patient has a known history of allergies to penicillin and sulfonamides. What is the appropriate choice of, of antimicrobial therapy? Okay, so let's break this question down. We know that it's a male patient. So typically with men, our, the normal bacteria that you typically see in a male patient would be proteus. Proteus is a gram negative, but most UTIs are gram negative. Most common UTI organism is E. coli, followed by Klebsiella, followed by, followed by proteus. Typically, men, you see more Proteus. Women, you see more E. coli. All of these are gram-negative, though. So we're looking for an antibiotic that will cover gram-negative organisms. We know we have an allergy to penicillin and sulfonamides. Okay, so we know that those two classes of antibiotics should be thrown out. Okay, so we're looking for something that covers gram-negative that won't be affected by an allergy to penicillin and sulfa. So let's go down. So we have our choices A, cephalexin or keflex, B, 
Cipro, C, doxycycline, and D, tetracycline. Okay, so let's figure out which of these is the right answer. So let's see what do these things have in common. Doxycycline and tetracycline. They both have the cleans or the cyclines ending. These are both in the same class, right? So we look at our classes of antibiotics and the tetracyclines is a class of its own. It includes tetracycline, doxycycline. They cover gram positive, gram negatives. So will that cover um, E. coli and Proteus? Possibly. It does cover gram negatives, but it's not entirely gram negative. So we, we put that in the back of our mind, but we also got to be a little suspicious of it because both of these are tetracyclines. Let's look at Keflex. Keflex. Let's look at our list of antibiotics. Keflex is a cephalosporin. It's, in fact, it's a first generation cephalosporin. So we have five different generations of cephalosporins. As we go down the list, it become it treats more and more negative, gram negative bacteria. So first generation is gram positive bacteria only. Second generation covers a little bit of gram negatives. Third generation covers almost all gram negatives except for pseudomonas. And fourth generation covers pseudomonas. Okay, so cephalexin, boom. First generation doesn't cover gram negative, so we know that is off the list. The next choice, Cipro, Ciprofloxacin, that is a fluoroquinolone. So we look at our four fluoroquinolone list. Oh, there it is. All right, Ciprofloxacin, gram negative and gram positive. Okay, so we know that the quinolones and tetracyclines can both cover both gram-positive, gram-negative organisms. Okay, so looking back at our list, we know that cephalexin's out, so we'll cross that out. Now our choice is between Cipro, Doxy, and Tetracycline. Okay, another reason why cephalexin would be out is that there's a cross-sensitivity between penicillins and, and um, um, Oh, my goodness gracious. Cephalosporins, that's what I was trying to say, cephalosporins. So even if that, you know, this was a covering antibiotic, like let's say they were they were trying to give you rocephin as a possibility because rocephin would cover a gram-negative uh, UTI, we would not want to give that because of the penicillin cross allergy. Okay? So doxy, tetra, and cipro. Now, looking back at what we know about UTIs, we know that certain antibiotics tend to work better in the bladder than others. And when we look at antibiotics that work well for cystitis or urinary tract infections, there's three that come to mind. The first one is rocephin, which we mentioned before, okay? Again, that's a third generation, not a first generation. So Cephalexin, that's our Keflex. And then our third generation, is, or excuse me, fourth generation, Cephapine, that's Rocephin. And that covers all gram negatives plus Pseudomonas. Okay, so that's a possibility, but again, we have that cross sensitivity. We don't want to use that. Um, what was I saying? Okay, uh, so we know that Rocephin is a good one for UTIs. We know that Bactrim is a good one for UTIs. Again, this guy has a sulfa allergy. It's, again, it's not one of our choices, but we can mentally eliminate that. And our third choice, if everything else fails, is we go to a fluoroquinolone, which is the Cipro. Cipro is a great antibiotic for UTIs. Again, it's starting to fall out of favor because of some of the side effects that you can get with Cipro, uh, especially QTC lump prolongation. Uh, sometimes there are tendinitis problems. I've actually had a friend that actually had a tendon problem in her elbow after she used um, fluoroquinolone for a uh, upper respiratory infection. So that does happen. You try to avoid the fluoroquinolones if you can, uh, but sometimes you have no choice. And in this case, we know that we have 
a probably a chronic UTI because he has a uh, chronically indwelling folic, or it doesn't say really chronic indwelling, but we know that's probably going to be more of a hospital-associated uh, urinary tract infection, which is going to be a little bit more difficult to treat than the run-of-the-mill ones that you probably would not get antibiotics for. So we want to get something a little stronger. So Cipro B would be the right answer there. Let's look at the next one, number eight. And this is another antibiotic question. Uh, a patient with a history of atrial fibrillation who is maintained in normal sinus rhythm with sotalol or beta pace is hospitalized for acute pyelonephritis, so infection of the kidneys themselves. The appropriate antibiotic regimen for this patient is intravenous. Yeah. Which one should we use? So let's go through our choices again. Now these choices are different than up here. So let's look at these objectively again, just like we did up there. So we're looking for an antibiotic that's going to be able to be used for a pyelonephritis. Again, gram-negative bacterium that is okay to be used with sotalol. Now, let's look at our choices again. So we have cefoxin. So we say, what the heck is cefoxin? That is a second-generation cephalosporin. So again, it covers gram-positive, gram-negative. Not usually the best one to choose when we're dealing with primarily a gram-negative antibiotic. Usually when you, when you know what you're dealing with, what kind of bug you're dealing with, you want to focus your antibiotic coverage to be either a pure gram-negative or a pure gram-positive when you have a very good idea of what it is. You don't want to be this wishy-washy, broad-spectrum stuff because then you can get resistant organisms. So you want to try to use one that's tailor-made. So probably not this one, okay? Ceftriaxone, we had talked about this one before. This is a fourth generation cephalosporin. Again, it covers gram negative uh, entirely. It's called gram negative, so that's all it covers. Then we have Cipro, which is our fluoroquinolone. We discussed that before. Again, Cipro is used primarily for urinary tract infections and pyelonephritis, so that would be a good one to consider. And then we have levofloxacin, which is another fluoroquinolone. Now, what's the difference between Cipro and Leviquin? Certain fluoroquinolones concentrate better in certain parts of the body. So the way I learned it was that the, the, the three major ones that you have are Leviquin or Levofloxacin, Cipro or Ciprofloxacin, and then you have, um, oh, what's the third one? It's not used very much anymore. It used to be used quite a bit. Oh my goodness. I think it's moxiflox. No, anyway. So, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the way that I learned it is that levofloxacin is good for the lungs. L for lungs. Ciprofloxacin is good for the bladder. C for cystitis. And that's the best way to remember it. So any kind of abdominal infection, like your diverticulitis, your pyelonephritis, your cystitis, use Cipro. For a pneumonia, a chronic bronchitis, use levofloxacin. All right, so let's look at these again. Let's, so now that we got the antibiotic straight, let's look at the question again. Which antibiotic should we use for acute pyelonephritis in someone that takes sotalol. So, what does sotalol do to your heart rhythm? And what, kind, what danger should you always remember with sotalol? So when we look at sotalol, the big interaction that we want, that we're looking for, is QT prolongation. So when people are on sotalol, this is a rhythm, a rhythm controlling medication for AFib, sotalol will increase the QTC. When your QTC is prolonged, you get this garbage here, you get torsades. Basically, it's a variant of v, v, uh, ventricular fibrillation. It has this waveform kind of thing. You treat it with defibrillation, lidocaine, uh, magnesium, and then um, 
and and, and, it's, and people are usually coding with this. So we so we measure the QTC on these people with Sotolol fairly regularly, but another another thing that that uh, um, fluoroquinolones are known for is also QTC prolonging a prolongation. So if we have QTC prolongation for both the antibiotic and the sotolol, that puts the patient at increased risk of developing torsades. So whenever, so when choosing antibiotic, we also want to look at other medications the patient is, is on. Will that cause an interaction between these? And this is what the test is trying to get you to recognize is that sotolol and a fluoroquinolone can drastically increase the QTC and we want to try to avoid it. So the best choice for this person would be ceftriaxone. All right, moving on. Number nine, what legislation allowed nurse practitioners to recognize Medicare providers in all geographical areas with their own provider number? This is one of the questions you just have to memorize. There is no trying to figure it out. If you don't know it, guess. And trust me, I have guessed myself on numerous occasions because I'm, I always mess it up. The correct answer is Balanced Budget Act. This one right here, okay? Um, Affordable Care Act did not do anything with that. Uh, basically, the ones you have to memorize and have down cold is the budget, Balanced Budget Act and HIPAA, both one and two. Remember, uh, one is COBRA, where you get to carry on your insurance. Uh, HIPAA two is with the um, protection of medical information, and that is managed by the Office of Civil Rights. All right, and number 10. A patient has fully recovered from septic shock due to bacteremia. The patient has been accepted into a long-term care facility for continuation of the antibiotics. Okay, so basically they had an MRSA infection and the hospital doesn't want to keep them just to get IV antibiotics, but they can't go home. So they go to like a sniff. Uh, the infectious disease physician has not seen the patient in two days because they said, yeah, just continue bank. Okay. The nurse practitioner does one of these following things. A, contacts the physician to determine the appropriate duration of the antibiotics. B, notifies medical staff services that the patient has not seen the patient. C, waits for the physician to come and see the patient. And D, writes transfer orders with, for the patient. Okay, so this is a question looking for chain of command and patient safety. So we got this guy or gal that's been sitting in the hospital for several days uh, with septic shock. The, the bug's been cultured out, the antibiotics been given, uh, the you know, ID doc has seen the patient say, yeah, go ahead and give vancomycin or linazolid or whatever for this MRSA. Okay, so, and the patient's getting better, you're getting ready to discharge him or transfer him out, and you're looking at the orders and the last note from the ID doc says, continue vanco. Okay. How long should you continue it? Depends on where the bug is. Do they have endocarditis? Do they have an infection on one of their heart valves? Do they have like an infected hardware, like a hip replacement or a knee replacement? Is it just a pneumonia? That all comes into effect in determining how long you want them on an antibiotic for. And you have no clue. You're looking in the chart and it says, I don't know. It just says continue Vanco. So it's, just, it's asking what you're going to do. Am I going to call the ID doc? Am I going to talk to mommy and say, mommy, Dr. So-and-so is being bad, not seeing his patient? Am I just going to wait for several days, hoping this ID doc will come by? Or am I going to take it on my own authority and just say, yeah, I think a week and a half will be fine. So, again, let's cut out the two obvious ones that we're not going to do, because this patient's ready to go. So, we're not going to talk to mama, all right? 
we don't we don't do passive aggressive stuff in the hospital you so you don't notify their chief that dr so-and-so hasn't seen the patient not going to happen not good for collegiality not good for anything never ever ever do this all right uh and then this one of course we're not going to do either this patient's ready to go we're not going to just wait and wait and wait and hope every day that this doc will come by and address the problem he might come by tomorrow and write this you know copy forward the same note continue vanco it didn't help us get this patient out of here so neither b nor c are the right answer so we're going to cross those out now let's take a look at the first two contact the doc to determine the appropriate duration of antibiotic therapy sounds pretty good or d takes us on our own cognizance we're going to take responsibility for it the best thing to do for the patient is to contact the id doc you just give them a phone call hey dr so-and-so how long do you want they say i want it on for two weeks awesome write your note spoke with dr so-and-so instructed me to continue antibiotics for two weeks as an outpatient awesome you've charted in in the chart that you've been in contact with the id doc there's been communication between the providers there's a clear logical chain of events and you're good if you take it on your own authority to write transfer orders for the patient you say well i've seen this kind of patient for i think a week and a half would be fine okay now that's your responsibility if they meant to have it on for three weeks for an infected hardware and you only put it on for a week and a half and that patient becomes infected again and they have a resistant organism and now they're going to have to amputate who's going to get the blame for that one it's going to be you because it's your responsibility to determine how long they have to be on the antibiotic you are not infectious disease trained there was an infectious disease doc on the case the lawyer is going to ask you did you contact dr so-and-so and a response of well no but i I've, I've seen other cases like this that ain't going to cut the mustard you're going to be responsible in a legal sense for this person's amputation if it, if they get osteomyelitis so it's very important that you follow the chain of command and this is a pretty obvious one you need to contact the doc to determine the length of the antibiotic therapy okay and uh, that takes us to the end of uh, the next five I'll get another five out in a little while and you guys good luck with your studying